Fargo. I'm uh, one of the remedial project managers on the Lower Neponset River Superfund site. Uh, it is within the Neponset River watershed, just farther up towards the city. Can you go on the slide? Absolutely. Sorry. And uh, I'll be talking about the Lower Neponset River Superfund site in general, some of our progress, uh, some of our community involvement, and I'll be showing a video during this uh, presentation as well. Uh, <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not. And I guess. Maybe not. There you go. Okay. Uh, so I did keep uh, all of our EPA site team members and partners just in case you uh, do end up getting involved with the site or end up uh, talking with our community involvement coordinator or I don't know where each of you live, but uh, we are setting up what's called a community advisory group. And I'll be talking about that a little bit more in the slides, but uh, I wanted to leave our, our partners up here just in case you did end up getting involved in any type of community involvement activities. That way, at least you may be familiar with uh, some of the names uh, that are working on the various parts of the site. We have, uh, especially something I was thinking about with Neponset River Watershed, I know that you all are working on, uh, as an organization, climate resilience and EPA, uh, the EPA Environmental Justice Specialist has a number of community grants that are coming up that actually work uh, a lot on resiliency projects. I can't personally speak on all of it because uh, it's not necessarily my program, so it's not my bread and butter, but I am aware of those projects and I do think of Nafonza River Watershed when I read the criteria for these projects and I'm like, wow, this this works exactly with what Neponset River Watershed is doing. So just wanted to keep those names up there for that purpose. So it's SKEO? Yeah, so SKEO, it doesn't actually have an acronym, but that's our one of our contractors that is uh, organizing our community advisory group. We're having a, 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 a outside contractor organize the community advisory group because we don't want any bias. And a lot, a lot of us working on the site are local to the area or uh, may know people in various groups. So it's best to have an unbiased, unconnected entity when you're setting up a community advisory group. So I'll first talk about the EPA Superfund program, and then I'll dive a little deeper into the Lower Neponset River Superfund site. Just briefly, Superfund is uh, a very uh, lengthy law. There's a, a number of statutes written under uh, what's called CERCLA. That's the Comprehensive Environmental Response uh, Compensation and Liability Act that was established in 1980. Informally, the program that we work under for Superfund sites is called the Superfund Program. And we're, we're responsible for cleaning up contaminated, contaminated sites around the country, whether that's a complex site like the Lower Neponset River, or that's an oil spill. Any type of contaminated media which could be surface water, uh, sediment, soil, those are typically cleaned up under the Superfund program if the federal government is involved. Can you stand for the podium if you want so we can see you? Oh, mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> uh, sorry, it's a little hard to speak loudly, so that's why I was trying to project a little bit. Uh, so the, our goals of Superfund are to protect human health and the environment by cleaning up these contaminated sites. We also uh, focus a lot. We have an enormous enforcement team to uh, build our enforcement case to make responsible parties pay. Uh, we also involve communities in the Superfund process. As I mentioned, we're working to set up a community advisory group, but there's also a number of other community uh, involvement methods that uh, communities can get involved in the Superfund process. And then ultimately, we'd like to return Superfund sites to productive reuse, be that a river walk trail or uh, if there is a uh, like a property that is is a blight to the community has contamination, eventually we'd like for that property to be cleaned up. Maybe it could be mixed mixed housing. Maybe it could be residential. Maybe it could be a park. It's really up to the property owner. But we want to make sure that we're uh, cleaning up the land and coordinating with the property owners the whole way through. So who manages Superfund? So Superfund is, uh, as, as noted, it is a federal program, but there's 10 regional offices across the country. So we're in region one. So we have the, the New England states and that's that's 
where our region manages. So I personally work just in the state of Massachusetts, but my program in the region works in all six states. And then nationally, there's uh, standards and, and all the standards are consistent, but each region does do work a little bit differently, kind of how different offices probably do things differently across the country. So uh, there's 10 regions across the United States. And then I wanted to just briefly touch on national priority list sites. So under Superfund, there are a number of different sites. There are, maybe you've heard of Brownfield sites. Those are, uh, that's a different program. Uh, what the Lower Neponset River Superfund site is, is a national priorities list site. So that means that the site scored, uh, there's a, what's called a hazard ranking scale, and it's scored to a certain number to rank it as a national priority, which means it receives national funding. It's uh, it, under the hazard ranking score. It has to it has to meet a certain criteria of a of a high enough hazard for it to receive federal funds. So the reason I include this slide, I feel that Superfund, the name Superfund, can be scary or. Uh, it can it create can create create a lot of questions for people, but there there are many Superfund sites across the country, and this Lower Neponset River Superfund site it's not alone. It's not the first sediment site to be cleaned up. Uh, it's not the first time the government has been involved with the cleanup. There's just with his historical use of of chemicals just before Circlo was created. There there are a number of of areas that need cleaned up throughout the country. So I, I included this map so that way people are aware that there is a lot of national priority sites across the country, but there's also a lot of competition for funding and uh, a need for immediate attention. So there's a there's a lot, lot going on with the national priorities list sites. So um, I my next slide is gonna be a map, but before I went into and discussed this map, <clears throat> excuse me, one moment. Not used to speaking so loud. I'm more of a soft speaker. So we have we have right now on on this site we are conducting our Superfund work using two different programs. We have what's called a removal action, which is a short term response. Those type of actions are usually cleanups that are take approximately one year or up to two million dollars is the way the statute's written. So those are smaller smaller projects, smaller subjective, but smaller projects. And remedial actions are for complex sites needing a long-term response. So the entire Lower Neponset River Superfund site, the 3.7 miles of the site is being taken care of under the remedial action program. And I just included uh, these figures, which uh, this clicker is a little bit hard to show, but sorry for those on, on, the, on the camera. But you can see here that this right here, it says greater than six months planning period. These are all removal. So we're talking, you know, zero to six months for planning how we're going to clean up these parcels. So those are for smaller jobs. Uh, you definitely need years to plan how to clean up 3.7 miles of river, for example. So here's the site. So uh, as I mentioned, there's two removal sites on abutting the Lower Neponset River Superfund site. So those are the short-term actions. So we have Lewis Chemical Site, which is at the beginning of the site. So I keep saying the site. The Lower Neponset River Superfund Site is 3.7 miles. It starts at the confluence of the Motherbrook and the Neponset, and it flows 3.7 miles down to the Walter Baker Dam. So the two removal sites that we have going on at the same time that we're investigating the Lower Neponset River Superfund Site is the Lewis Chemical Site. And then we also have a Riverside Square PCB site where there was a contaminated dredge spoil that was placed along residential property. So those were smaller areas that could act as sources to uh, the entire river. And because they had a smaller footprint and it was uh, abutting the river and it did not require uh, years of planning for how to clean up those sites, we were able to conduct action under the the removal program for the Lewis Chemical site. And then uh, we're in, we just finished our investigation for the Riverside Square PCB site. Along this part, uh, this is all within the Neponset River watershed. So along the lower Neponset River Superfund site, we do have two dams as well. We have a Tileson and Hollingsworth Dam approximately one mile downstream from the start of the site. And then as mentioned, at the end of the site, there's the Walter Baker Dam. And this site flows on the Southern 
portion of this map is Milton, and then the northern part is Dorchester and High, uh, Mattapan and Hyde Park. So we're working with a lot of communities as, as we conduct our remedial investigation. So why was the site listed? The site was listed because there was known contamination from polychlorinated biphenyls. So polychlorinated biphenyls are uh, referred to as PCBs. They were a, a fluid that was used in many, many processes. Uh, they were manufactured from 1929 all the way through 1979. And as mentioned in my last bullet, hundreds of commercial and industrial applications. Prior to 1980, there was, there was no laws on how to dispose of, of these chemicals. So perhaps companies may have discharged their waste into the river or they may have dumped uh, onto the soils, or they may have managed them and put them in drums. But um, there are PCB, PCBs in the Lower Neponset River, which is why the site was able to be listed uh, for on the national priorities list. So this is just, there's hundreds of examples, but I just put a couple uh, because I thought that people would be familiar. I mean, lubricants, cutting oils, construction materials, these, these contaminants are were ubiquitous to, to industrial practices. They're banned now, but they're still around. So why are PCBs an issue? They have demonstrated to cause a variety of adverse health effects. The Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry has uh, an, an enormous portion uh, set aside just for the uh, adverse effects of polychlorinated biphenyls, but they do also have a, a, a fact sheet that uh, is a little bit easier to read that explains what are PCBs, uh, what happens when they enter the environment, how do PCBs affect my health, and then if you were interested in reading more, uh, you could look into the uh, Agency for Toxic Substances Disease Registry full write-up on the health effects of PCBs, but I wanted to share this because if anybody is interested in uh, viewing the fact sheet or learning more about them, about PCBs, feel free to reach out to me. I do have cards and I can provide all this information for you. PCBs do not readily break down in the environment. They're, they're, they're essentially forever chemicals. They stay in the environment, they adhere to organic matter and they're there until they're essentially excavated out. So they are uh, subject to any anything that's gonna come in contact with them, be that fish or mussels, humans, birds, uh, it, it just sits in the sediment until someone is able to take it out or it continues to discharge downstream. Fish consumption appears to be the major pathway exposure. Uh, this is due to bioaccumulation uh, as the, the, the lower entities on the food chain continue to eat other organisms. PCBs bioaccumulate in the fatty content of each uh, species that's being eaten in the food chain. So if you have uh, fish, those are going to have a higher concentration of PCBs in their fatty content versus a mussel, for example. So fish are, are, are the major pathway exposure to humans because they have the larger concentrations, the higher concentrations of PCBs. So the Superfund remedial process, uh, the site was listed in 2022. As mentioned, we had to uh, do a preliminary assessment. We had, even though there's been a, a lot of sampling that's taken place, we did have to make sure that the site was able to be scored on the hazard ranking score to be eligible to be on the national priorities list. So the site was listed in March of 2022. And uh, right now we're conducting what's called the remedial investigation and feasibility study. After we've come up, basically we 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 look to find out the uh, extent of contamination in the river, and uh, we do know that there's PCBs, but it's likely that there's other contaminants of concern. Uh, we call them potential contaminants of concern. But this river had uh, had a very long industrial history. They had paper mills, they had the chocolate mill, they had uh, a number of lumber mills, coal coal use, uh, to so many different industries. And we have to make sure that we know what contaminants we need to build into our cleanup plan before we actually do the cleanup. It's likely more than just PCB contamination, just based on the industrial history of this river. So once we do we we, we, do, we develop different feasibility strategies, we'll put together what's called the proposed plan. When we go to the public and we say, this is our strategy, this is what we want to do, this is how much it costs. And we put that out to the public comment. 
we hear the public comment, we respond to comments, we hear from potentially responsible parties. And if all goes well, or or if it doesn't go well, we we go back to the drawing board and you know remap what we needed to do if it doesn't work for that community, for example. But if it does work well, then we'll go into uh, what's called the selection of the remedy. We uh, we essentially have a decision document called the record of decision, and we say this is this is our remedial action objectives. This is how we're going to clean it up, and this is the cost. It's more detailed than that, but there's that is essentially what a record of decision is. And then from there, we're able to design, for example, our dredge prisms to a more exact. Uh, design and then we we start the the true cleanup the remedial action eventually we want to get to an operation and maintenance stage where if we we maybe had to cap along some bridges because you don't want to undermine uh the structural integrity of a bridge it's likely we we may have to do a small amount of capping this is not pre-decisional <laughs> i'm just speculating what may what may have to happen that that would be what would happen under operation and maintenance maybe those caps will have to be looked at by the state from there on out um We'll figure that out once we finish up all of our feasibility studies. But eventually, we want the site to be deleted from the national parties list. Once we clean it up, we we would like to be deleted. And as you saw on the map, there's a number of other national priority list sites that need federal funding. So we're looking to get through our process and, and clean up the river and be done with it or turn it back to the community. So... Remedial activities conducted in, as I mentioned, the site was listed in 2022. We did all of our contracting, which does take some time. And then in 2023, we were able to get our boots on the ground and start getting a uh, a larger characterization for the extent of, of uh, contamination throughout the river. So we phased out our sampling. We started, uh, we did phase one sampling in 2023. We mapped the river, we mapped the channel banks uh, with our it's called bathymetry. Uh, we did a historical and cultural resources survey. This river does have a very long, uh, long history and and likely a tribal history. We need to make sure that we're being respectful of of anything that's historical or cultural before we start, start digging. So that's why we're conducting that historical and cultural resources survey. Uh, we also conducted a wetland survey. We actually found two wetlands along that first mile river, and we'll be conducting. Well, I'll be talking about what we're doing in twenty four, but. We conducted a, the wetland survey and found two wetlands. Those are now going to be protected wetlands um, now that they're, we know that they're wetlands. And uh, we also conducted sampling for this first mile river. So this is just a picture of what the bathymetry survey looks like. This is what's, uh, it's called sediment profile imaging. This helps us uh, essentially know what the ecological health is of the bottom of the river. I was really surprised the ecological health is is pretty good for the for the bottom of the river. There's a lot of leaf litter, a lot of organisms, a lot of uh, aquatic worms, and and uh, it's definitely not not barren. So this is this is positive. It's it's helpful for as we do our our monitoring long term. So that way we have something as a baseline to compare to once we clean up the river. This is just a, the top part is just a snippet of uh, the historical and cultural resources survey. Historical and Cultural Resources Survey is pages long, but for the purpose of this presentation, it's just a snip. And then this was just what some of our mapping looks like. Uh, this would be an area where it would be challenging to bring an excavator in and remove. So we need to make sure that we have a good reconnaissance of our river when we're thinking about strategies for how are we going to clean this up? Really, really technical, like boots on the ground, really like, how are we going to do this? Is it possible to get an excavator along the river? Do we bring a barge? Do we dredge? You know, there's so many different possibilities and ways to clean up a river. It's actually, uh, it's a lot of brainstorming, but it, it, it can be very complicated. So as I mentioned, we did phase out our work. We do know that the first uh, mile of the Superfund site does have what we what we know so far the highest levels of PCB contaminated sediment these levels are extremely high and a lot of it is impounded behind the Tileson and Hollingsworth dam that's that dam that's on that first mile so this is a picture of the Tileson and Hollingsworth dam so right now there are ways that uh you can conduct early action some of that is through the removal program which i mentioned that the Lewis chemical site and uh the 
the Riverside Square PCB site, but there's also another mechanism for something that's a little bit more complicated. And that is uh, what we're looking at right now. So behind the tiles in Hollingsworth Dam, we know that there's highly contaminated impounded sediment and we're conducting what's called an engineering evaluation and cost analysis. Uh, this will be conducted under what's called a non-time critical removal action, which means basically not that it's not important, but that you need at least six months to plan. So because we're working behind, we, we plan to work behind a dam, that does take a lot of time to plan and work with the entities that own the dam and figure out how we get equipment in, uh, figure out what we're doing with that waste once we get it out of the river, turbidity, silt curtains. There's, there's so many components that we need to figure out before we get any type of equipment in there. Uh, and start removing contaminated sediment. So right now we're conducting uh, an engineering evaluation and cost analysis. And uh, in my next slide, I talk about the schedule. So regarding the engineering evaluation and cost analysis, I'm just skipping a little bit ahead. Uh, we do plan to have that completed this fall. So we're looking at our alternatives. We're developing a strategy for removing the contaminated sediment behind the Tileson and Hollingsworth Dam. And we plan to have that uh, in environmental, uh, the ECA, the Engineering Evaluation and Cost Analysis Report this fall. That is, that does go out for public comment, similar to a proposed uh, proposed plan. So that will go out to public comment and we very much want the public, and, and you don't have to live right next to the, the site to, to provide public comment. If you have insight or you want to just review the plan and, and provide your feedback. All feedback is welcome. You could live in California and you can still, you know, comment on on the on the, uh, the the engineering evaluation cost analysis. So when that does come out, feel free to get involved. Take a look at it if you if you'd like to get involved uh, and feel free to comment. Comments don't have to be highly technical either. It could be as simple as, "Hey, did you know that there's a tribal canoe buried right along the tiles in Hollingsworth Dam. That happens. I, I work on a super fun site in uh, in New Bedford. I can't tell you how many tribal artifacts and shipwrecks we've found that nobody knew about. But it's it's just so incredible. So really, all comments are are wonderful to uh, to have. It doesn't have to be highly technical. So uh, yeah, th that's going to be coming out uh, public comment period this winter. In the meantime, as we're developing this engineering evaluation. We're also going to uh, continue the rest of the sampling. So we plan on sampling from the Tileson Hollingsworth Dam all the way to the Baker Dam uh, from spring through fall. So we'll be out there this May. We'll probably be there through giving us a little bit of weather events, so probably November. Uh, and also, we we did sample last year, as I mentioned, for the phase one area, but we're completing that phase one data support there, uh, report. There's data validation. We have to compile the data. We have to have everything mapped. So we'll have that all completed this summer. EPA subcontractors do the sampling or EPA staff? Uh, so right now, uh, the subcontractors are doing the sampling, but our lab is involved. So uh, they came out and helped us do site reconnaissance, and they may be analyzing samples in the future. So... Uh, right now, the load is just, it's its thousands of samples, so it was a lot easier to have uh, a subcontractor go out and, and conduct that work. You're right, the questions now. Huh? That's completely up to Benny and Sean for how they want to, I do have time for Q&A at the end, but I, I I'm fine with it. Through idea of the volume of sediment that might ultimately be removed. I know you don't know the answer to that, but can you give us a feeling for the scope of the project? Oh my goodness. Um, no, I don't know yet because all the data we have is just for PCB contamination. If there's dioxin samples, which we did sample for, and I know we got hits, that's going to have to be taken care of as well. High levels of metals, that's going to have to be taken care of as well because those, those are... Uh, very bad for fish um, in aquatic environment. So and with their toxicity value. So I don't, it's gonna be thousands, tens of thousands of cubic yards easily. Like I'm positive there's tens of thousands. Yeah, if not hundreds of, to, to, to provide a little bit of context, uh, we removed over um, 1 million cubic yards from New Bedford Harbor. So uh, it, it's gonna be a big job. It's gonna be a big job. My next question, I think you partially answered it, but 
this whole region from Dorchester all the way down to Renton was a very active area for, it was really a university for shamans pre-colonial. So I think it's very likely there will be artifacts uh, that have since been inundated by the erection of the dams. Mm -hmm. Are you doing uh, subsurface uh, surveys specifically looking for artifacts that might have been submerged by the dams as part of your assessment of cultural uh, you know, uh, factors? Not right now. So that is that is a good point. We're not there just yet because we're not ready to it, it's called remove earth so we're not right now we're we're just taking something that's like the size of my water bottle and coring and taking a sample uh down into the ground but that's 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 all the penetration that we're doing into the earth we're not moving earth just yet but we have started coordinating with uh three federal tribes and one non-federally recognized tribe and the state historic preservation society to start conversations and hear what their opinions are for how we should be conducting any type of subsurface analysis um, before we break ground. Absolutely. And my final question, you're working above a dam where there's a lot of contamination. Is it ever an option to uh, bypass the dam, drain the dam and work at low water levels as part of yeah. this? And is that being considered for this project? Yeah, I think that would be, I think the, well, we can't be pre-decisional yet, but I think the best way to do it would be to coffer dam sections of the dam and remove it dry. But that's just my thoughts so far. Yes, I, I do think water will have to be diverted and obviously will have to be managed closely. DCR owns the dams and there's a lot of interagency coordination that's going to have to take place, but uh it it would be nearly impossible to remove contam highly contaminated sediment. Um, just for context, the residential standard for cleanup in in a yard is one part per million. In in your backyard, there's eleven thousand parts per million behind the dam. We don't want to mobilize that. So the best way I think to manage that would be to coffer dam sections off and remove the contaminated sediment while it's dry, because that way you're not mobilizing it. And then it's dispersed to who knows where. We know where it is. And the dam has done a really amazing job at blocking the sediment. There's always impoundments behind dams. So it's kind of a blessing that the dam's there in a way, if you think. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing. But it is how it, it will. I think it'll make things a little easier. Knowing the history of the Charles River, any chance of contaminants coming into the front of the Mother Brook? So Mother Brook was cleaned up in 2007 through 2009, and there was a significant amount of uh, PCB contaminated sediment that uh, we believe may have migrated from the Mother Brook, as the Mother Brook is one of the, the primary tri tributary to the Neponset. And that was I'm sorry, what was that? Yeah, that was finished in 2009. It was a major cleanup, and they diverted the river for that. Uh, it was it was an enormous I think it was like 12 million dollars to clean that up and it was all done under the state and there was uh some very large potentially responsible well I guess they would be responsible parties at that point that that clean that both sides yes I'm pretty sure it was both sides uh I can provide you the report if you're interested um it is it is a public document and it's on our website and I can uh I'll give you my card yes. okay Great. Any other questions? Okay. So I don't know if you all live around here, but maybe you go to the site periodically. There's a really beautiful greenway trail. Uh, so I did want to just touch on what I think is one of the most important parts. How do you reduce your potential risk to exposure? Because this doesn't look like a super fun site, to be honest. You have this beautiful harvest bridge, canoe launches, uh, on both pictures, we have the Greenway Trail. There's 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 so much use of this river and you have a super fun site that's right next to it. So how do you reduce your risk? So we have wonderful partners here in, in the state of Massachusetts and uh, Nipponza River Watershed Association. We work closely with as well. Uh, we Massachusetts Department of Public Health has attended many of our meetings in the past and are very involved in the site. They've been involved at the site, I believe since 1994, when the first fish advisory uh, was administered for this area, when they started doing sampling uh, for fish. And the Massachusetts Department of Public Health put together this recreational use of the Neponset River community fact sheet. 
It is a fantastic fact sheet that talks about uh, safe ways to use the river, recommended ways to use the river, uh, activities that are not recommended, and then it talks about the fish advisory. The fish advisory is not just for, it, I think it's important to note, this fish advisory is not just for the Superfund site. If you see on the, the writing that's right under the Neponset Dam, it the this fish advisory goes between the Hollingsworth and Bowes Dam in Walpole all the way to the Walter Baker Dam in Boston. And uh, the fish advisory is for children under 12, pregnant women, uh, nursing women, or women that may become pregnant. It's advised not to eat any fish in the river in that area. Just catch catch, catch and release. And then for all other people, they the, the recommendations are to not eat uh, white sucker or American eel. And then for all other fish, eat you can you it is recommended that you should eat no more than two meals per month and then this is just the the fact sheet just one moment the fact sheet is multiple pages but it does talk uh very much about how can i safely use the river it's safe to to continue walking and biking and boating and rowing it's also safe to fish and release but it's not recommended to swim in this river and it's not recommended to wade in the river and then the fish that are not recommended as well and it has steps to minimize your potential exposure like you know wear wear shoes so that your feet don't touch areas of the mud or soil uh it, it's a really great fact sheet I, i'm really i'm really happy with it and it's on our website and if you want more information on that or just want to spread the word or you know somebody that uses the trail and and maybe wades this would be a good good recommendation to share is the reason it's all the way up to walpole because those creatures move upstream or are there other sources of contamination further upstream? That's a great question. And it's hard to say because we don't know the migratory area of each fish, but I think it's unlikely that it's all contributed to this site because of so many dams. There's not a lot of fish passage. There's not fish passage all the way to Walpole. So the DD, so the other uh, contaminant on the advisory is DDT. That's in many streams unfortunately it's still around um in fish and so uh pcbs are also they were used everywhere there there is low levels of pcb contamination in many areas um but i can look and talk with the the state on your question if you'd like but i i do think it's not all attributed to the site just because of dam passage just kind of thinking of that uh type of way to think about it hi ann I just I was just gonna add that the next dam upstream from the tiles to the upstream dam is the hall of the fish the fish dam. Whether they want to or not, they can't be very good swimming. The hall of the ram. I was thinking of the mother brook. I'm sorry. There's a number of dams there. Yes, mother brook you can. Question? Well the many cleanups that we've been doing in the river in the super fun site, should we not be allowing people into the river as part of the cleanup process? For the Neponza River watershed, it is not recommended to wade or swim in the river. So it's not recommended to come in, in contact with the mucky stuff and in the Superfund site boundary. I would not recommend it. The Department of Public Health doesn't recommend it. Ultimately, these are just advisories. You know, it's it's entirely up to you and, and your risk of exposure. Um, that that that's entirely up to you. But it's not recommended to come in contact. And we we truly don't know where all of the contamination lies at this point. The whole entire river, the 3.7 miles, when you're sampling, you're just sampling an area. The, the, the contamination is not necessarily homogeneous in every area. If you have like a deposition area that might have organic content, you might have higher concentrations. If you're in a sandy area, it's unlikely you'll have PCB contamination because there's nothing for the PCBs to adhere to. So overall, until we really know the dynamics of this river, it's it's not recommended to come in contact with the mucky stuff at this point. So the sampling data shows the concentration at different points along the three point seven miles. It will. And then will it become possible to make decisions on cleanup activities? Because your your process is a multiple year process, mm -hmm. but our cleanups are annual. Understood. So I'm just asking if we should pay attention to that data once we've got it, and then act accordingly based upon what we see. Uh, we we work really closely with Ian uh, and and Neponset River Watershed. We that was one of the first things I brought up when when we when the site was listed because I I knew you all did the cleanups um, and we talked closely about it. Ian, do you want to? Just gonna say, if anybody's noticed that the last couple of years the river cleanups like we've been getting you know bottles and 
stuff on the shore instead of leaving like cars and engines off the side of the river. There, there's a reason for that. Um, and uh, as much as folks are enthused about getting into the river, we're, we're kind of holding up it. And frankly, DCR has told us we are prohibited from letting anybody go in the river. So, uh, we have some stuff. For now, <laughs> we're going to be dredging soon, hopefully. So, <clears throat> okay. So this is just a picture of a white sucker fish and American eel. So community involvement. Thanks for getting involved at the Superfund site. Uh, there are principles we have uh, actually required uh, to have some sort of community engagement at, <clears throat> excuse me, just one moment. I apologize. <laughs> Written in the statute is a requirement to have the community involvement. That can vary based on your community involvement coordinator or how involved the community is, but uh, we do have to develop what's called the community involvement plan to hear the, the community's perspectives and opinions for how we disseminate information and how we can get involved with the community. We are very active with this site and the community is also very active with us. So, so far it's been incredible all the towns, the neighborhood associations, these types of being invited to these types of meetings, we want community involvement as much as possible. Uh, you know, we are we are public servants. We work, we're paid by taxpayer dollars, but it's it's important for um, us to listen to all of your opinions and comments and perspectives. This is very much not a top down process at all. Uh, so people should have a say in decisions that affect their lives. People have important information that can inform decision making and community involvement is a better outcome for everyone. Uh, so we did develop what's called the community involvement plan. I think some, well, I know some of the Neponset River Watershed folks definitely partake, partook in our uh, focus groups. So we basically uh, met with various community members or stakeholder groups, such as the Neponset River Watershed Association, neighbors that live live along the site, uh, teachers, every, everyone that wanted to get involved, we held uh, smaller uh, community focused, um, they are called focus groups, and, and we we asked questions to develop what's called what's called the community involvement plan. We asked questions that were like, how, what, how do you want to have your information? Should we send out mailings? Or do you want us to have a lot of public meetings? Do you want a community advisory group? Or do you want us to just go on the radio? You know, what, what will... Um, what are you wanting from us? And then there's a lot of other community involvement questions. Uh, what languages do we need to think about for translating? Um, a lot, a lot, anything that's related to community involvement, we we ask and we incorporate. And this community involvement plan was uh, was finalized in November 2023, but it is a living document. So as the site changes over time, the community involvement plan will also be updated to reflect any changes that the community brings to our attention to uh, to to incorporate into. How, how we need to disseminate and work with you all. We also developed the baseline use assessment. In one of my first slides, I mentioned that one of the goals of Superfund is to return the site to, to reuse back to the community. So uh, we, we, we did what's called the baseline reuse assessment. Again, we had community focus groups. We met with the town. We met with planning boards. We met with members of Neponza River Watershed Association. We met with, with abutters of the river and anyone who who had an idea of, of, of property use. Um, and we we asked, you know, what do you envision for, for this site? What do you envision for Lewis Chemical? What 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 plans, we met with DCR, you know, what plans do they have for trail making along the river? Those are all things that we want to think about as we're developing our strategy for cleaning up the site. And this these are all public documents as well. And then, as I mentioned, we have a contractor right now that uh, we just had our public meeting last week, last Tuesday. And uh, for the second half of our public meeting, we had the con the contractor from they're called SKIO come and uh, do a presentation. It's called a community advisory group informational session. And so at that informational session, uh, the contractor talked about how to set up a cat a community advisory group. What is a community advisory group? How do you get involved? All all of the facets of community advisory group. He explained and. Uh, and talked about to get people involved into a community advisory group. So it's the community advisory group is called a CAG. Uh, the CAG basics, basics is an informal organization. It's not a decision-making body, but it does give members a voice. There's essentially, it can be set up in different ways based on however the community wants to set it up, but there's usually a steering committee. There's representatives from each 
community area, and uh, they provide recommendations on the cleanup and and our process and and really any you can provide recommendations on on anything that you want really um, and they help to disseminate accurate site information to broader communities. So uh, if we had a representative from Neponset River Watershed, maybe it could be Benny, and she would attend. They, there's requirements and. The steering committee sets up, you know, what are the the parameters for our CAG? And it's very grassroots driven by the community. And maybe you all will end up holding monthly meetings. And then Benny would come back and talk to everyone and say, hey, this is, this, these are the alternatives that EPA is thinking about for the feasibility study. Or, hey, I noticed that there's a large Haitian Creole population that uh, moved by the site. So we need to talk with them about making sure all of those fact sheets are translated and sent, you know, in the respective language, just, just anything really. So uh, that's what the CAG is and it's in the process of getting set up. So right now uh, we just sent out an email, our community inv uh, involvement coordinator sent out an email and is asking people to get back. Uh, I think it's by March 8th, but you know, it can be the next week too. It's not a uh, hard and fast deadline of March 8th. Do you have a question? We were working on getting this established. Yeah. And the, the possible watershed set up uh, with the help from the state uh, community action committees. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what? It was, so we went through all that, and we, this is dam removal, and yeah. we discovered that the, the PCBs were mm -hmm. a problem. What's the difference between the CAC and the CAG? Is there a legal definition or is it just an informal? I'm actually not sure because I wasn't involved, and that's that was not a federal CAG. So I can't speak on on that CAC that you all had put together, but I am familiar with your talking with what you're talking about. I I have the the document with the recommendations and all the groups. I'm I'm familiar, but I I, I can't programmatically speak on what the differences are between the two because I only know about the community advisory group that Superfund can establish using contractors. Sorry, that I don't have a better answer for that. Also, there's a number of community involvement resources. There's I think Neponza River Watershed has got received a tag for something in the past. Maybe it wasn't a federal one, but okay. So uh, technical advisory grants, technical assistance services. There's there's a number of resources available for communities. Uh, some of these are funding based, which is great. Grants or just bringing in a consultant. There's a, there's a lot of opportunity for community involvement. So uh, we do have a community involvement coordinator. Her name is Zanetta Purnell. She's wonderful. And uh, if people from Neponza River Watershed are interested in learning more, uh, she would be the person to contact to talk about the community involvement uh, in resources specifically. And then just quickly, I just wanted to share a video. And then I think that will be the end. She doesn't. I don't think so. All right. Uh, I think she's supposed to be speaking now. And we can't hear her. Mm, hold on. Penny, can you help me? Thanks. Monic River in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. That it was really. Okay, sorry, I was just restarting it, so I didn't miss anything. Community involvement is a cornerstone of EPA's Superbug program. EPA sees communities as key partners in the cleanup decision-making process and understands that effective community involvement yields better cleanup outcomes. Today, you'll hear from two community members on their experience working with EPA and how their involvement is integral to the success of Superbug cleanups in their communities. I'm Jane Quinn. I grew up on the banks of the Housatonic River in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, that when it was really polluted. From the early age, I blamed the General Electric Company that was upstream of where I lived. Since the early 1900s, GE manufactured and serviced power transformers, organs, and plastics, and used numerous industrial chemicals into the Pittsfield plant. Improper use and disposal of electrical transformers containing hazardous chemicals called power chlorinated polyphenols, also known as PCBs, led to contamination around the GE Pittsfield plant and downstream along the length of the Pusatonic River. The number of PCBs and other hazardous substances in Pittsfield and the Pusatonic River has progressed under an October 2000 consent decree. So far, 20 contaminated sites of the GE plant have completed cleanup, including 
residential properties in Silver Lake, as well as the first two lines of the Housatani River. One of the things that has been really helpful for the implementation of this river is citizens coordinating council with CCC meetings that are organized by the Environmental Protection Agency. When we first joined one of the meetings, it was a meeting citizens from threatened communities, as well as the EPA, and in our case, the General Electric Company. Sometimes you'll have spooks of lots of information coming out, and then it feels like nothing happens for a while. But there's an ample joint, and slowly but surely, we've had two miles of our river cleaned up so far. But we so live, the Winnells Quartet River Water Center Council. It means as many partners as possible. And the super fun process close as many communal meetings as possible so everybody knows what's going on. I think to just get a great insight into the site itself and how people are using it or how they want to use it. We ask as advisors to be coordinated. We put the community in touch with what's happening on the city and we get input from the community. Okay, so it is a little bit of a longer video, and I don't want to take up uh, too much time from the Neponset River water quality discussion that's supposed to take place tonight. But uh, I can, this video is public, and uh, I can coordinate with Sean to make sure that it is sent out afterwards if you are interested in watching it. But it's just an example of uh, community involvement that's taken place at other sites and uh, how it's been really successful. So that wraps up my presentation. And uh, one other quick yes. question. You might not, not have an answer to this one either. <clears throat> I'm just wondering, after all the sediments removed, where does it end up or where is it likely to end up? What happens to it? It will likely go to a, a landfill that's certified to take whatever waste is inside of that contaminated sediment. Would so that be nearby or far away? It depends on how contaminated it is. Uh, if it's really low levels of contamination in certain areas, it, it could be local. Uh, these will all be certified landfills to manage hazardous waste. But if it's highly contaminated waste that's hard to manage, it could go uh, it could go across the country, it could go to specific incinerators. It really depends on the volume and, and how much waste each facility is accepting and then also the cost to transport it. So we'll know when we get a little farther along in the process uh, when where it goes. All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Uh, I'm going to leave some cards with Sean if anybody wants my contact information. But uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, your involvement at the Lower Neponset River Superfund site. All right. So now it should be all squared away. Um, and we'll uh, hand it over to Bunny to talk about cool. the water quality results from this past year. Thank you. It's great to hear from Natalie about Superfund. 
So now we're going to talk a little bit about the water quality results from our sampling program from this past summer. Um, so we'll just go through and there'll be throughout the presentation, different places to ask questions. And then we'll do some more questions at the end. Um, can you hear me in the back? Is this speed okay? Can I have, yeah. All right. Wow. See what Natalie means about the pointer. All right. So um, this is kind of going to try and get everybody on the same page about what the Deposit River Watershed Association is, um, about the Community Water Monitoring Network. And so for some of you, you might already be familiar with all of this, but we're just going to go through some of that. Um, so the Neponset River Watershed Association, or NEPRA for short, is a local nonprofit conservation organization founded in 1967. Um, so that's about 57 years ago. And we serve local communities based around the Neponset River. So all of the 14 cities and towns in the watershed. Our goal is a clean, healthy, and accessible river and watershed from the smallest headwaters to the wide open brackish waters of the estuary. So we have a map of the Neponset over here. A map of the, um, so here's the Neponset in the middle. And then we have uh, all of the towns in the watershed. So um, just to get us all on the same page, a watershed is an area of land where all the water drains into the same place. Water flows from the tributaries into the main branch of the river and eventually out into the ocean. So now focusing in a little bit on swimming. Uh, SWIMIN is our community water monitoring network and call it SWIMIN for short. It's kind of C-W-M-N, the kind of acronym. We sample at 41 different sites across the watershed. So on this map and the one in your hand, all of these different dots are places where we take water samples. Um, we mobilize over 50 volunteers to help us sample once a month, every second Thursday from May to October. That's uh, six months of the year. And people are gathering that data. It helps us to ensure the health of the river all across the watershed at all of these different points. Um, as you can see, all of the sites are labeled with these site codes. So the one I'm circling is NER150. Um, so that indicates that it's on the main step of the Neponset. So NE, Neponset, R, river. And then it is 15 miles from where it starts. Um, another one would be like Pine Tree Brook. This is PTB 047. Uh, so Pine Tree Brook and then 4.7 miles from where it starts. So throughout the presentation, we will see those little site codes. And for those of you who are familiar with swimming, um, you might be able to look for your site. Or if you maybe know some of the streams in the watershed, that could also help you kind of orient yourself with this map. So now we're gonna get into the different things that we sample for. And for this section, we're going to go through E. coli and then total phosphorus and then dissolved oxygen. So we we'll start with E. coli. So we sample for E. coli and the reason for that is because E. coli serves as an indicator for fecal contamination in the water. So that contamination is coming from animal waste or leaking sewers. So just with that, it's important to remember to always clean up after any pets or any dogs that you walk outside. And the test for this is done at Massachusetts Water Resource Authority, or MWRA. And then this little picture serves as like an example as to what that test might look like. Um, so the way that we assess E. coli uh, is for human health and recreation. Um, so we have some different standards. So for safe to swim, we would see less than 235 colony forming units per 100 milliliters. For uh, safe to boat, we would see less than 1,260 colony forming units per 100 milliliters. And for water that is unsafe, uh, we, will be, we would be seeing greater than 1,260 colony forming units per 100 milliliters. Uh, NEPRA only tests once a month. So if you are thinking about swimming in any of the streams in the watershed, it's important to check with the local board of health to understand if that water is safe that day, 
We only really understand based on our testing if it's safe at the time of sampling. Um, and we can use that data to get a good picture of health across the watershed, but not telling us what's happening two weeks later, for example. So this graph is showing us the percentage of sites that meet e the E. coli standards. And it's broken down by month, so all of our sampling months. So in May, we have about a little more than 75% of sites that are meeting the swimming standards. And then some additional sites that are meeting the boating standards. So the boating standards are not as strict as the swimming standards, but people are still able to boat on that water safely. Um, and then in June, we have some more sites, maybe uh, 85 um, meeting the swimming standards and then the rest of our sites meeting the boating standards. In July, we see a little bit of a dip in the sites that are meeting the swimming standards. Um, and then some more meeting the boating standards. And we do have a few more failures than in previous months. In August, we see a pretty big dip. Um, fewer sites, less than 50% of our sites are meeting those swimming standards. Um, and another really big chunk are just meeting those boating standards and more failures than the previous month. In September, we see a huge change where we only have maybe like two or three sites meeting those swimming standards. It's two sites. Um, a few meeting the boating standards, maybe 10, um, a lot more failing. But then in October, we kind of jump back up and we can see a large majority of our sites meeting those swimming standards. Um, only a handful that are only meeting the bo boating and a couple that failed. It's so. 2023 specifically? Yes, that's 2023 specifically. Thank you for that clarifying question. So this is the seasonal average broken down by site. So on average, we have two sites that fail, uh, 20 sites that are safe for boating, 19 sites that are safe for swimming. Uh, so those site codes, same site codes as we saw on the map uh, earlier and as the handout in your hand, if you took a handout. Um, yeah. So I'll just give everyone a second to look at this and then We'll see more maps. All right. So each point on this site is a swimming site. They are color coded based on um, whether or not they fail on average or safe for swimming on average and safe for boating on average. Um, so this is for the entire season. And we're going to contrast that with this map, which is just for the month of September. So September was the rainiest month out of all of our sampling seasons. And as you can see, we have a lot of black dots, meaning that there were a lot of sites that failed. And we think the reason for that is because when there's more rain, there's more runoff coming off of the roads. Um, so more E. coli that is like on the roads, like an animal waste, washes into the streams. And then that leads to more sites failing. Um, so the only two sites that are passing are in areas with very low impervious surface cover. So I have, um, yeah, question. questions about E. coli. In the early slide of sources of E. coli, it did not mention wildlife, but could wild, migratory wildlife be a factor for the difficult results in September? I mean, when the geese start massing along the bodies of water, could that be contributing to the result? Yeah, I don't think it's not a factor, but I couldn't say for sure how much those migratory species are contributing. Yeah. Um, so this is the end of the section about E. coli. So if there are any other questions or comments about E. coli, I can hear them now. How do we choose the day of the month that we go out to sample? Um, I think it just has been the same day since we've been doing the program. Second it's the second Thursday of the month, yeah. Uh, is there significance that some of these points are, are squares and others are circles? Yes. Um, so the next section we're going to do is total phosphorus. And the squares are ponds and lakes. And the circles are flowing sites. Good question. Yes. Uh, no, I don't think so. No. It's just a follow-up on a question. So the pond is lucky that it doesn't have any mines or overflows, unlike the Charles and the Mystic. Um, but it does mean that every time it rains, 
all those, the surface water, uh, all the runoff gets right into our streams. So at low levels of rain, we don't get the cleaning effect of the sewer system. And the double sewer treatments. That's good. Thank you. Um, anything else about E. coli specifically? All right. Now for total phosphorus. So the reason that we sample for total phosphorus is because it can cause algal blooms, um, which means there are more algae in the lakes and fish die, um, and also related to an increase in cyanobacteria. That contamination comes from erosion, leaves, fertilizer, and car exhaust. Um, and we also have that tested at MWRA with a spectrophotometer for phosphorus. Um, this picture is an example of what that could look like. This is not at MWRA, um, but that's why it's up there. Um, yeah, and we also have like this picture of a link. So total phosphorus is not directly a human health risk. Um, and as I mentioned a second ago, it is assessed based on type of water body. So there are different standards for flowing streams uh, than there are ponds and lakes. So for flowing streams, um, we would like to see less than a tenth of a milligram per liter. And for ponds and lakes, we'd like to see less than uh, 0 0.025 milligrams per liter um, because ponds and lakes are more sensitive to algal blooms and aquatic plant overgrowth. So that's why they have two different standards. Notes on the con contribution for um, the contamination. It, it didn't mention septic system. Our septic system is not a source for phosphorus. Uh, I'm not sure. Not too like so thoroughly. Um, I, I, I just thought there. Um, I don't. I don't really know. Phosphorus is presumed to not travel very far through the soils. It's a question of how quickly does it get into the aquifer. Modern systems generally will not release much phosphorus to the ground. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right. So um, here are the percentage of flowing sites that meet the total phosphorus standards. Um, so as you can see, kind of overall, we're seeing a lot of green on this graph, on these graphs. Um, we are seeing a lot more failures in September. Um, September, September was a rainy month. We don't normally see a correlation between rain and total phosphorus, uh, like if a site meets the total phosphorus standards, but we do see this like kind of huge dip in September and that goes back up in October. Um, so we're thinking about that as a possible reason, but definitely could be looked at more. Um, and this uh, is the percentage of pond sites for total phosphorus, um, as you can see. So this is just one pond um, that was able to meet the standards for half the summer. Um, there's nothing special about that pond. It was pretty close to failing, actually. So it kind of just happened to pass. Um, oh, we do see a lot more pond failures throughout the year. Are those pond samples taken near the surface or at depth? Um, kind of near the surface. No, there's every table, so it makes sense. Um, so this is a map that shows the swimming sites that are meeting the phosphorus standards. Um, as I said before, most of our flowing sites are passing the circles, and most of the ponds, all of the ponds, are failing. Um, you can see here are the ponds, the squares. Um. We have one flowing site that's failing, or two. Um, so it's not like a perfect picture, but we can really see a very strong difference between the ponds and the flowing sites. This is a map of September highlighting the rainiest month. And as I said, normally phosphorus and rain, uh, or normally phosphorus isn't as affected by rainy weather, um, but September, this September was definitely an outlier this past September. Um, any other questions about total phosphorus at this time? All right, now we're gonna talk about dissolved oxygen. 
So for why dissolve oxygen, I think this one might be the most straightforward uh, is that everything needs oxygen for life. So that's why we sample for it. Um, affected by flow, temperature, and decomposition. Cold water holds more oxygen than warm water. So there are different cold, wa cold water and warm water standards. Um, so trout and other cold water species need, need cold water and high oxygen. Um, so the uh, cold water standard is greater than six milligrams per liter. And the warm water standard where those fish are less sensitive is greater than five milligrams per liter. So the two charts that we're gonna see, first we're gonna see warm water and then we're gonna see cold water. So these are the percentage of warm water sites that are meeting those standards. So the yellow are sites that just meet the warm water standard of greater than five milligrams per liter. And the green is greater than six milligrams per liter, which is also greater than five. So you can kind of imagine that this whole yellow and green chunk is like what would be passing. Those are both, you know, meeting those warm water standards because these are all warm water sites. And then we have our cold water standards, the sites that um, meet the cold water standards. So we just want to look at the green on these. Um, so we can see may, um, no sites that are failing or just meeting warm water standards. In June, same, no sites that are failing or meeting those warm water standards. In July, um, we have over half of our sites are meeting the cold water standards. Some of them have warmed up and are only meeting the warm water standards. You can see kind of similar in August and September. Um, there are some failures in July and some failures in September. Those tend to be kind of the hottest months. So water's kind of warming up. Um, and then we can go to October and see that all of all the sites are meeting cold water standards. Uh, yes. Uh, that's just something that happens sometimes with sampling. All of our samplers are volunteers. Um, so if there is some, sometimes a sampler can't access a site um, or if something happens to the sample, then we don't have that data. Good question. I also just also the you know, standards. Uh, occasionally there's issues with calibration on meters and this, therefore we can't trust the results. Yeah. Um, are there any questions about DO before kind of move on to the next little section? I'm trying to recall, was September an unusually warm month? I just don't remember. Um, I don't recall either. I don't remember. I don't think it was particularly warm. Um, good question. All right. So just to help us all get a sense of how this year compared to last year, um, on all of our different kind of sampling points, E. coli looked very similar. Uh, the rainiest month I think was July. Um, and we saw that same kind of dip in sites meeting the swimming and boating standards for the rainiest month. For the phosphorus flowing sites, 2022 saw more failures throughout the summer. Um, but interesting kind of random is that 2021 saw more failures in September specifically. Um, I don't know why that is, or if September 21 was also particularly rainy, um, but it was interesting when I looked at those graphs. For the ponds, um, last year we had one pond uh, that passed for five months as opposed to it passing for three this past summer, um, but still only just the one pond that ever met those standards. And for dissolved oxygen, it's a very similar picture this year and last year, um, but both years are worse than they were in 2021. So that is kind of how it stacks up to some of the previous data that we have. So I'm gonna talk about what do we do? We have all this data, what can we do with it? Um, so for individuals who might be interested, and always think about getting involved in local conservation commissions, making sure to clean up after pets, any dogs that you walk outside, um, and practice smart lawn care. So we're not having that kind of fertilizer wash off into the streets. At NEPRA, we are going to continue to do hotspot sampling when we see an issue. 
um, and advocate for impairment listings so we can kind of get rivers and streams uh, cleaner. And at the city and town level, can work on improving stormwater infrastructure and edu educational campaigns to help people um, really understand the ways that their actions can impact the health of the river. So at NEPRO, we don't just do this for water quality. Um, there are also some other projects going on. So we have the Embrace a Stream project uh, with GBTU, uh, Greater Boston Trout Unlimited. Um, conductivity project, measuring how much road salt gets into the river at various locations. And an estuary project, um, talking to communities around the Neponset River estuary. All right, one last thing before um, you all go, that our annual cleanup is happening on April 20th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. at uh, different sites throughout the watershed. So if you are interested, you can register at neponset.org slash cleanup. You can also scan the QR code if that's something you would like to do. Um, I would be so happy to see you all there. Yes. Can you add another sentence or two about the estuary project? No, but I can ask Sean. <laughs> Great question. Um, so Betty mentioned we're currently working with communities around the estuary to talk about climate change. We're also, we actually got some uh, funding from the state to look at the current state of the salt marshes in the estuary. Um, and also we got some federal money to um, better um, adapt the climate and the flooding models that are statewide, specifically for the deposit. Um, that'll help us do some long-term planning. So just want to say thank you to all of our volunteers at MWRA and our community members. This wouldn't be possible without you. Um, then I can open it up to questions.